Today we're going to talk about Upstate Cord Blood Bank Cord Blood Collection Process. The objectives for today, to understand the cord blood collection quality and safety requirements, to perform the cord blood collection process, and to complete the EMR documentation. Let's first talk about quality and safety. The quality and safety of the collected cord blood must be ensured in order for the unit to be used for a bone, manor, bone marrow transplant. This is primarily done through a distinct tracking process. That includes three things, our kits, the collected unit, and documentation. In regards to the kits, we have bags or kit numbers attached to each of the kits that have been supplied to you. Expiration dates and lot numbers are very important. They're also on the collection kit label, which is located on the outside of the two gallon Ziploc bag, and you will see it in the upper left corner. Here's an example of what that collection sticker looks like. It's got a barcode. It actually has a, a specific number attached to it, the lot numbers, the manufacturer date, and the expiration date. It's important that the, the kit um, bag comes back with this lot number connected to the cord blood collected unit. There's also a temperature control or something called a data logger, which is right here. And it is responsible for, main, for measuring the temperature within the environment. The manufacturer has deemed that there are certain temperature ranges that are important to, to maintain the integrity of whatever the product is. So if it's the collection bag or whether it's the tubes of blood or uh, the betadine swab, there are certain temperature ranges that we have to maintain in order for the product to be considered of quality and safe. So this data logger, which is right here, is actually located in where the collection kits are stored in your labor and delivery unit. On a regular basis, members from the Cord Blood Bank will come over. They will switch out this data logger and download the information which will track the temperature of the environment. Regarding the collected unit, there are timing constraints that are placed on the processing of when the cord blood unit needs to be processed after it's collected. Also, tracking of the unit once it's collected, which if we look at this form here, uh, this, this picture of our consent procedure checklist as well as our transport log, this is the tracking of the unit. So it tells us where the unit um, goes from the time that it is collected and into the uh, the cord blood bank container and, and then into our actual bank. So it's very important that we track the unit once it's collected and especially the temperature of the environment. And that's where the temperature control, which there is another data logger placed inside of the rolling container that you place the collected cord blood unit into or the maternal bloods into um, so we can maintain that there is no breach in temperatures. Regarding the quality and safety of documentation, we have to track the unit to the staff and the providers. So that is why with this sheet, this consent procedure checklist, we ask you to initial, we ask what provider did the delivery. This way that if there's any questions or any concerns, um, or if there was a, a breach in the manufacturer's product, that we can track it back to staff members that participated in the collection of the cord blood. Also documentation of tracked times of collection, when it was placed in the cord blood bank container, and when the courier picked up the unit. Also, the documentation is extremely important. It is a communication of any outstanding tasks. So this sheet, basically the consent procedure checklist, tells us exactly what has been done and what needs to be completed. We will talk about this a little bit more at length. And lastly, documentation in your EMR. EPIC has certain indicators. There are certain prompts that have been built in regarding cord blood collection. And we can talk about this just a little bit more towards the end of the presentation. 
So you have a mother who comes to the unit. If she has not already been offered or provided information from the prenatal office or childbirth education class on cord blood donation, then go ahead and give her one of the bra uh, BRAC cards, the brochure, or the patient information sheet. This is the patient information sheet and it is laminated. There are a few copies up on your unit available for patients to read. It has the most amount of information and most likely will answer most of the questions that, this, that the potential donor will have. So my recommendation is to provide patient information sheet, um, especially since it will probably answer most of her questions. In regards to the process, we're going to talk about obtaining the collection kit, obtaining and completing the consent and questionnaires, collecting and labeling five of the maternal tubes of blood, collecting and labeling the cord blood unit, completing the consent and procedure checklist, preparing the cord blood unit for pickup, the maternal refusal form, and your EMR documentation. So we start off with the cord blood collection kit. It is actually, once a mother has agreed to donate her baby's cord blood, you can obtain the kit, which is located in the storage space near the labor and delivery ORs, or operating rooms. It is, there is a special space that you will see where we will have a number of kits up on a shelf, and you'll also see the rolling container. When you see the collection kit, this is what it looks like. There is a large two gallon Ziploc bag. Here is the sticker I was mentioning um, in the for uh, last couple of slides and also all the components that you need for cord blood collection are within here with the exception of the consent um, and the two questionnaires and we'll, we'll talk about where to obtain those. If the mother does not have completed um, consent or the two questionnaire forms um, or they have not been scanned into the media section from providers who have EPIC within their office, because um, that's where they will be located is in the media tab of EPIC. What you need to do then is print off the most recent consent and the two questionnaires from iPages under the birth Sam Family Birth Center Manual or off of our website from www.upstatecordbloodbank.com. The contents of the collection kit, there is a consent and procedure checklist, transport log, um, which is on one page and it's brightly colored pink, so it obviously sticks out um, from all the other paperwork. There is one betadine swab, five tubes of blood, one small biohazard bag in which the five tubes of blood are housed in, one Paul medical HPC cord blood collection bag, one large biohazard bag, and one two-gallon Ziploc bag with the kit number on the outside. In regards to the consent form, you need to use the most recent IRB consent form, have the mother read, sign the consent, and then you need to check for completeness. You need to make sure that the boxes are checked. There are two boxes um, or, or lines that the donor needs to check off. The mother needs to be sure that she signs and dates the consent and also provide an address and contact information. And there are important reasons why we need to have her contact information. And I'll talk about that in, in the next couple of slides. So this is what it looks like in terms of the consent form, the front page. Place the maternal label at the top of each page. Then you want to be sure the box is checked that the donor agrees that court, the Upstate Court Blood Bank may obtain her or her baby's health information from the hospital or providers. Also, you want to be sure that there is an updated IRB stamp and date at the top of the left corner of each page. On page two, you want to place the maternal hospital label again at the top of the page. You want to be sure that the research box is checked. So this is the second box that needs to be checked or line. And if the reason why we want this checked is if her unit or if this, this donated unit is not acceptable for treatment purposes, then we do have the ability to use, send the unit off for research and it's quality research. 
and we do need her permission for that. The last page on form three of the consent form, of course, again, place the label at the top of the page. You want to check that the donor has signed, dated, and provided contact information. And the reason being is when the unit comes into our cord blood bank through our accessioning, it is now changed over from an identified patient to an identified number. If you look on the consent form, there is a box down here, and this is where we actually place our barcode label, the cord blood bank barcode label, and this is now how the unit is identified. So it is no longer attached to a person's name or medical record number. Also, we need to contact her if her infectious disease testing is abnormal. And what we'll do is actually we'll contact her provider, which then that provider will in turn will contact her for any additional treatment or testing that needs to be performed. Lastly, if she should need her cord blood for future use, she can call the cord blood bank to see if the unit is still available. And again, the only way that we're going to be able to connect her to that unit is through her contact information, which is here on the third page. Again, once it comes into accessioning, the unit comes into accessioning, it is now identified as a number. Lastly, with the consent form, once it's completed, you place it into the sleeve of the large biohazard bag. The Upstate Cord Blood Bank needs the completed consent form in order to do any of the processing. And along with that, we have to have the consent and procedure checklist in order to do any of the processing, but most important, we do need the consent form. Regarding the questionnaires, there are two questionnaires that is required by the, by the donor. There's the maternal risk questionnaire, which is needed to assess the mother's health risks. And then there's the family medical health questionnaire, which is needed for the family health history. You are responsible to check for completeness and verify that all questions have been answered. Verify that the mother has signed both documents. And this is what it looks like. Here is both of the front pages of um, the questionnaires. And we're going to ask the mother, you're going to ask the mother to write her name and date of birth on the top of each page of the questionnaires. This confirms that if the pages get separated, with her name and date of birth at the top of the page, then we know that that page of questionnaires belongs to the rest of the um, pages with her name and date of birth on it. You wanna place a hospital label in the appropriate box of each of the questionnaires. And again, it's the mother's label. Once this uh, question, once the questionnaires come into the cord blood bank, it did, again, it's turned into um, a, a, a number rather than a person, and um, the cord blood bank will put in their own label, so then it becomes a number. You need to be sure that this box on the first page or the front page of the maternal risk questionnaire is checked. It's a question, or it's actually a statement stating that she understands HIV and AIDS um, in terms of the infectious process. And then lastly, question number five, if a mother answers no to the maternal risk questionnaire number five question, you need to provide her with the patient information sheet, rat card, or uh, brochure. Again, my recommendation is the patient information sheet because it does have the most amount of information on it um, and that will, it will most likely answer her questions. On the last page, the mother is to sign the, and date the last page of each questionnaire. And then also the staff member is um, to review for completeness and then sign and date as well the last page of the questionnaire. What you're verifying, because this is verified by, what you're verifying is that each question has been answered. And also, if there is a yes to one of the questions and there is an additional response required, then it's, rec then it's required or it's recommended that, that um, excuse me, the, uh, um, the donor needs to write in the response to that question. So for example, if she answers yes, she has been exposed to a sexually transmitted disease, we need to know the date of that transmit sexually transmitted disease, 
what disease it was, when was it treated, and if at all possible, was there a test of cure with a negative result. Again, if any infectious disease is to be thought attached to this cord blood unit, then it will um, disqualify the unit for further processing. Again, with the questionnaires, when completed, you want to place both questionnaires in the sleeve of the large biohazard bag along with the consent form. You're going to see a theme with that. Regarding collecting maternal blood, this is another quality and safety measure that is to be performed for infectious disease testing on maternal blood. The Upstate Court Blood Bank sends the maternal bloods to the American Red Cross to perform the following tests. ABO, RH, and the antibody screen. Chagas, hepatitis, HIV, West Nile virus, cytomegalovirus, and syphilis. A lot of these tests are performed during the pregnancy. However, we do have to verify for the quality and safety of infectious disease that this is not positive or active. Any of these results are positive or active disease at the time of the collection of, cord, of the cord blood. Labeling maternal tubes. The goal is to obtain the maternal blood samples on admission. However, blood can be drawn any time before the patient is transferred to the postpartum unit. What you want to do is you want to affix the maternal hospital label on each tube at the bottom in a flagged or dog ear fashion. You want to write the date, time, your employee ID number on the white space of the tube. You want to be sure not to cover any expiration dates or lot numbers. The American Red Cross will, will toss out the tubes and disqualify them, which then it will disqualify the cord blood unit. Lastly, you need to collect cord blood per your hospital policies and procedures. We are a lab and they, we still have to abide by the policies and procedures of the hospital and lab. Transporting the maternal blood, place them back into the small biohazard bag and seal because they will come in the biohazard bag. Um, so you're going to put them back into the small biohazard bag. If the mother is not going to deliver before the next courier pickup, which is 830 every morning, Monday through Friday, then you need to place the collected tubes in the upstate cord blood bank container as soon as possible. Otherwise, place them um, in the two-gallon Ziploc bag with the collected cord blood unit and accompanying paperwork. So, for example, you have a patient that comes in at 3 o'clock in the morning. She wants to donate her baby's cord blood, but she will not deliver before 8.30 courier pickup. Go ahead and draw her maternal bloods, put them in the small biohazard bag, seal the bag, and then place it into the cord blood bank container for courier pickup at 8.30. After she delivers, whatever time it is, 12, 2 o'clock, 5 o'clock, then you can go ahead and put the rest of the, the, two, um, the cord blood unit and paperwork in the ga two-gallon Ziploc bag into the um, container. We will already have the maternal bloods. If she, del if she comes in at, at 11 o'clock in the morning, and doesn't deliver until 11 o'clock at night, you're going to put the um, maternal bloods with the collected unit all together in the two gallon Ziploc bag and put it in the cord blood bank container. The magic number is 8.30 in the morning, whether she's gonna deliver before or after, and also when she's admitted before or after 8.30. In terms of collecting the cord blood unit, the HPC cord blood collection kit is in the silver sterile package, which is located in the kit. What you want to do is open up the kit using sterile technique and place on the delivery table prior to delivery. Providers will have already been trained on the collection process, those who are participating, and after the collection, please prepare the cord blood unit for pickup. Labeling the cord blood unit is also very important. You want to write the date, time of the collection, and the employee ID on the white space and the white label of the cord blood um, unit. Do not cover any lot numbers or expiration dates because this will also void the use of the cord blood unit for transplant. 
You also want to place a maternal hospital label on the back side of the HPC cord blood unit. This again identifies that this unit belongs to this donor. However, when we when we process it or we receive it into our accessioning lab, it will then change over to a cord blood barcode number. And, she, and this unit will no longer be identified with a patient name and medical record number. Again, you have to abide by your hospital policies and procedures for specimen collection and labeling. Packaging the cord blood unit, this is gonna be a common theme. You wanna place in the large biohazard bag and seal. That's the only thing that goes inside the bag because of the, the blood contamination on the outside of the collection bag. You wanna place in the two gallon Ziploc bag with the accompanying paperwork in the sleeve. And then you wanna place this whole two gallon Ziploc bag into the Upstate Cord Blood Bank container within one hour of collection. We need to again verify that the temperature of the environment, which we which we only have less than an hour to be able, is our wiggle room per se, um, it does need to be in the um, temperature monitored container in less than an hour after the collection. The consent and procedure checklist is one of the most important pieces of documentation um, in terms of telling the story of the cord blood collection process. Of course, we need to put the maternal and the baby hospital label on the top, in the top right corner. And the reason we need to have the baby label is that if we have any tests that came back positive on the cord blood, we do need to notify the provider. And also, we do need some um, hospital records and information on the baby as well as the mother, and we need to have the medical record number especially for metabolic screening, newborn screening results. Whomever is collecting the documents is responsible for tasks one to three. One to three is your consent form, your two questionnaires. What we need to do on this form here on the consent procedure checklist is you write, need to write in the date that the forms were collected from the patient. You need to check the boxes of um, the maternal hospital label was affixed to the documents in the correct spots. And also you need to initial it. And this tells us who was responsible for um, collecting or obtaining this, this information. You want to also confirm with another nurse or another staff member that the questionnaires are complete and both staff members need to initial here. Uh, it's very important with the questionnaires um, because if a questionnaire question has not been answered correctly, meaning that the, the donor did not answer the, um, the additional question to yes or provide the information, then it will uh, disqualify the unit for being processed. Whomever is drawing the maternal bloods is responsible for task five, which again, you write the date in terms of the day of the collection. You want to put a check mark that you have applied the maternal label to each tube and then the initials of the person who did obtain the blood. Whomever is labeling the cord blood unit is responsible for tasks four and six. Again, you also want to uh, put the date that you had collected the cord blood unit, check mark that you put a maternal label on the cord blood unit, and then obviously you want to put your initials that you are the one who actually did this task. For task six, you want to make a copy of this form. Place the original, which is the brightly colored pink form, which is this, in the large biohazard bag sleeve with the consents and questionnaires, and it needs to be sent, it needs to accompany um, the cord blood unit. The reason it's really important is the pink box, and I'll explain that to you in a minute, at the bottom of this page, that is. Task seven, you need to keep a copy of the document in the mother's chart until the mother is discharged and then give to your manager. You also need to write the ethnicity or at least check the boxes for the ethnicity and race. We do, do need to know the delivering provider and the delivery date and time. And again, this is where the tracking starts in terms of times and when um, the temperature regulation will, will need to be in place. This box is very important. You need to write the date 
the time that the unit had gone into, was placed into the Upstate Cord Blood Bank container. Again, the unit has to be in the container in less than one hour of collection. So we have, if we look here, we have the delivery time, and then we have the time that it was placed in the unit, and it's got to be less than one hour. In terms of a reason why the cord blood unit was not collected, please document the reason as to why. Um, it could be any reason. Mother changed her mind. Provider wasn't able to get. There was too much bleeding. Emergency C-section. Just so we know why the um, the kit has to has been sent back without a cord blood unit, because we do have to track each of our kits um, and provide an explanation as to why it was not um, collected after she had signed the consent form. And then lastly, you need to um, check um, and put your ID number and put your initials in if a mother decides that she refuses to donate. And then I'm gonna, we're going to ask you to complete the maternal refusal form, which we will talk about here in the next few slides. Transport log. This is to ensure quality and safety of a unit. It is important to document specific times and temperatures of the cord blood unit. It is also important for accuracy for our reporting, as well as it confirms the integrity of the cord blood unit during the storage and transport. So if you look at this form, there's nothing that the staff has to do, but I just want to explain the purpose. When the courier comes to pick up the unit, the, the courier will put in the date, the time of the pickup and who the courier was. This box is for our accessioning um, lab staff to fill out. So when we receive the unit, they will place a cord blood bank unit uh, barcode label on here. So again, now this becomes a unit um, with a barcode rather than a patient identifier. And then we have to um, put in our temperature reading. Um, was it within the range? Because this, each of our containers has a data logger and we will download the data and attach it to the file, attach it to this form so we can ensure that the temperature was not breached. Preparation for transport. Again, you've heard this before. Contents that go into the large biohazard bag are the collected HPC cord blood unit with the attached needle. That needs to go inside the bag and again because of the potential of blood contamination on the outside of that bag, we'd rather keep it inside um, the large biohazard bag. Maternal risk questionnaire, the family medical health questionnaire, consent form, original consent and procedure checklist and transport log which is the bright pink sheet needs to go into the sleeve of the large biohazard bag. Then you take that large biohazard bag and you put it in the two gallon Ziploc bag. You also want to put in there the small, bio, small biohazard bag with the five collected tubes of maternal blood. We did say that the large biohazard bag with the questionnaires that is signed and dated as well as the consent and procedure checklist. Do seal the Ziploc bag so contents do not get spilled all with inside the container. You want to place it in the Upstate Cord Blood Bank container, which this is what it looks like. There is a label on the top that says do not close the lid tightly, and it obviously um, is put back in um, the area where you have um, the collection kits already stored. So there is an area that this container will, will be placed. With the um, two gallon Ziploc bag, be sure that it does have the sticker on it um, so we can verify that it, it has the kit number, it's the right kit that goes with, that con with those contents, contents. Now if a mother decides she wants to refuse, there is a maternal refusal form and she can refuse the collection at any time um, during the collection or the process. If a mother has signed the consent form, then you must complete the consent procedure checklist um, and also the refusal form, which is located on iPages or, excuse me, our Upstate Cord Blood Bank website. You want to fill the box in the lower right corner of the consent and procedure checklist, which I mentioned a few slides ago. You want to place a maternal label and a baby label on both of these forms. 
Again, so we can identify the mom and the baby to that unit if there was a collected unit or to the maternal blood. You want to write the reason for the refusal on the form. You also want to write, uh, have the mother and staff member sign and date the form. You need to call the Upstate Court Blood Bank to notify us of the refusal and then fax the maternal refusal form to us. And this is only in the case that if the unit has been collected and we are in the process of processing it. Um, this way you can alert to us that the cord blood um, donor, the mother, has refused and we will stop all processing. Now if the cord blood unit has not been collected or picked up, you can just place the used or unused kit in the Upstate Cord Blood Bank container with the maternal refusal form and the completed section of the consent and procedure checklist for the next courier pickup. Of course, we're going to need the consent form and we're going to need any of the unused um, HPC cord blood collection, any maternal blood tubes that were used or unused. So just send everything back to us in the large two-gallon bag. In terms of EMR documentation, it is important um, that document, um, for documentation of the collection process. And this is done through two ways, which is our consent and procedure checklist, as well as through um, your EMR documentation system, which is EPIC. This helps your colleagues know of any unfinished tasks, and it's also important for quality control. We are able to download data and, and do an analysis that will help improve the collection process at the provider offices, in labor and delivery, postpartum, and at the cord blood bank. You have your um, obstetric trainers, your labor and delivery postpartum trainers that um, are familiar with the EPIC documentation. Um, EPIC did do a good job of building in um, cord blood bank indicators, drop downs, and alerts. Um, it's important to complete those and follow through with them um, in order for us to continue to try to improve the, the functioning of this program um, and, and also provide the best quality and the safest um, cord blood unit to any potential transplant um, recipient. If you have any questions, there's a couple of um, avenues and resources for you. You can um, talk with your OB trainers um, and educators, and also refer to the laminated step-by-step -step guide on your unit or call me. The laminated step-by-step -step guides are strategically placed in a few areas um, on your unit, um, and it does have pictures, and it allows you step-by-step -step guidance as to how to uh, perform these this procedure in this collection. You may also call Upstate Court Blood Bank and we would be happy to answer any of your questions. Appreciate your support in cord blood banking. You are truly making a difference and we thank you.